The Candyman President, The Financial Reality of Generation Y, and our top book pick of the week. I'm Afan Chaudhary. Welcome to Globe Now. Ukraine has a new leader, and he is widely known as the Chocolate King. Meet Petro Poroshenko, the next president of Ukraine. He is worth an estimated $1.4 billion, and he made that money largely off of candies and chocolate. However, his job now is to bring calm to the turbulent East and bring sweet success to the troubled economy, which he is promising to do. He campaigned on a message of stability and job growth, and that message has resonated with voters. So who is this billionaire-turned-politician? Well, Petro Poroshenko was a university student studying international relations. Then, after the Soviet Union collapsed, he went into the cocoa business. He started scooping up old Soviet-era chocolate factories in Ukraine, Russia, Lithuania, and Hungary, and paying his factory workers an above-average wage. His company bears the middle part of his last name, Roshan, and it is the country's largest confectionery manufacturer with 320 different products. Roshan factories produce 450,000 tons per year, and its sweets are sold around the world, including in Canada. And they are so popular that even one of his rivals said she buys Roshan chocolate. All of this has a bittersweet end. He promised to sell his businesses if elected president, except for the TV channel that he owns. Now, stay with us. Up next, the financial conundrum facing Generation Y. How financially independent are young adults today? Well, the Globe and Mail is looking at this question all week, and our personal finance columnist, Rob Carrick, joins me now to discuss. Welcome. Thank you. So, Rob, you're using a survey, a survey by Abacus Data and Wyconic as your starting point for this analysis. What are some of the key findings from this poll? Well, I mean, I, I don't want to say that, you know, Gen Y millennials are in financial crisis. Uh, many are doing just fine out there. But what we're finding is there's a surprisingly high level of financial dependence on parents. Uh, we've, we've heard the term failure to launch used for uh, used for Generation Y. It's almost like a failure to thrive financially. A lot of people are getting by in various ways and to various extents with help from parents. Mm. And, and what about savings? Are, is, is Gen Y managing to save any money? Well, not really. Uh, you know, you expect that oh, young people don't save very much money. They're just starting out in life, and that's perfectly normal. But we're finding in the survey that even into the early 30s, people are still struggling. There's a substantial number of 30 to 33-year-olds who are paying the bills with help from their parents. Now, in your opinion, what should be the financial priorities of a 20-something-year-old who's on the verge of being financially independent? Okay, well, first thing you got to do is pay off your student debt. Vitally important. That's the sort of the stepping stone to financial independence. From there, you need a job with a decent level of income that will help you pay your rent and put a little bit of money aside. If you can't do that, if you don't have a job that's going to pay you enough to do that, then I really urge people to consider moving back home with their parents. Consult your parents, see if that's okay. I think it might be a good way to sort of gather your resources together until you can get that, that job that pays enough to give you financial independence, because that's really where it starts, with a decent paying job. And how much is that happening, does the survey show? Well, you know, uh, a lot of people in their late 20s are still looking, almost a majority of people are still looking for that career first job. It, once you get into your early 30s, most have found it, but a striking number still have not. You know, I, 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 it's not finding work because part-time work is available and even full-time work. It's work in your field where you're beginning your career, where you have a trajectory of rising pay and rising prospects. People are struggling with that. Now, uh, Rob, what is your advice to the parents of millennials in these situations? Okay, you know what? It is normal parents for you to be helping your adult kids. Uh, don't feel ashamed that your kids aren't, aren't uh, spectacularly successful. It's happening all over the place. And, and some parents are underwriting almost their kids' whole lives. They're paying bills for them. They're, uh, they're paying for them to live at home. Other parents are buying down payments for their kids. This is normal. You need to discuss with your kids what you can afford to do reasonably and comfortably and what they can contribute to it and come to an agreement. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Glad to do it. Well, if you're a millennial or a parent of a millennial, you'll want to stay tuned to the Globe and Mail's personal finance pages all week. Uh, there you'll be able to find more of Rob's insights, interactives, and a blog from a recent university grad who is trying to make ends meet. Uh, you can ask Rob questions about this topic on Twitter. Just be sure to use the hashtag, hashtag GenYMoney. 
Now we're going to switch gears a bit and our books editor is going to share with you his top book pick of the week. It's a love story between an American woman and an African man set in still segregated 1970s America. Take a look. Dean Alman Gestu has become one of the most acclaimed young writers in the world. Uh, and he's become so for writing novels that are huge, beautiful things about, about truth and humanity and politics and all these big themes. In his new novel, All Our Names, his best book yet, there's a woman named Helen who's a social worker in the middle of America in the 1970s. And there's a young man named Isaac who arrives in the same town uh, from war-torn Uganda where he's been involved in revolutionary activities, seen unspeakable violence. And at its core, it's a story about how these two very different people fall in love in a place that is, in a sense, basically still segregated. You're told the novel by alternating between chapters featuring Isaac, he goes from Ethiopia to Uganda, and Helen as she meets Isaac. And of course, you know that eventually Isaac and the Isaac chapters will get to America and meet Helen. Dean Alman, guess who is a master of this form? He, he draws these two threads together with such delicacy and such precision that when they finally do merge in the book's extremely moving ending, you find yourself devastated. Um, you know these people better than you ever thought you could know a fictional character, and here you see them united, their stories connect. Uh, and it's just heartrending, kind of ravishing stuff. Well, that's it for today's show. If you've uh, got a minute, hop onto Twitter. Tell us, do you think this new leader will be able to bring peace between Ukraine and Russia? Or uh, do you have some thoughts on the conversation with Rob Carrick? Are young people today worse off financially than their parents' generation? You can find us at Globe Now. I'm Afan Chaudhary. Thanks again for watching.